Welcome to the webinar on uh, the continuity of learning. Um, my name is Claudia Marroquin and I'm the Director of Admissions at Bowdoin. And I was asked to serve as our moderator for today. Um, I was part of the Return to Campus Working Group um, that met um, as soon as President Clayton Rose um, asked um, Jen Scanlon to assemble a group of faculty, staff, and students um, to think about how uh, the fall semester could work. And then the folks who are joining me today were actually in the group that really planned how, how to um, have the fall semester work. So I'm gonna have everyone introduce themselves first. Um, and again, we do have live captioning happening. Um, so you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom if you would like um, to see closed captioning. And we will be using the Q&A function. Um, so if you have questions for any of our panelists, please go ahead and type your questions in the Q&A. The chat function has been disabled. Um, so the only way that you'll be able to ask your question is through Q&A. Um, and I've asked all of our panelists to prepare a few remarks. Um, so we'll get to the questions that are coming in um, probably in about 15 or 20 minutes, but please go ahead and start asking questions um, as they come up for you. So Rick, can I please have you introduce yourself first? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rick Bruni. I'm an organic chemist and professor in the Department of Chemistry, as you might imagine. And I was the chair of the committee that came up with the report that sort of guided um, the approach to online learning that we're currently trying to carry out. Thank you. And Katie, you're up next. Hi, my name is Katie Burns. I direct the Baldwin Center for Learning and Teaching. Um, I've been at Bowdoin, I think, for about nine years now, not continuously. Uh, and I mostly do work with faculty development right now. So I support faculty in the development of their pedagogy and what they know about learning and teaching. Great. Thank you. And Michael, can I have you introduce yourself? Sure, I'll be happy to. My name is Michael Cato. I'm the Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer, uh, which means that I'm responsible for leading the information technology departments here at the college. And um, I've been here now two and a half years. Got to add the half, that's new. So two and a half years now. And very important half. Is <laughs> and Jeremiah, the last but not least, can you please introduce yourself? My name's Jeremiah Brown. I'm a, a sophomore now, class of 2023. I come from Cabot, Arkansas, um, and I am attending Bowdoin as a full-time student who is looking to major in sociology and education. Um, this summer, I was the orientation intern for the Dean of Students Office. So I work um, extensively with partners on campus as well as the class of 2024 in bringing those 460 first years in planning their orientation program. Thank you. And I will selfishly add that Jeremiah also works for the admissions office, um, both in the spring as a tour guide and then now as an intern for what we're um, hoping and or actually planning will be an online open house again this year. Um, so to kick us off, I'd love um, for each of you to comment on um, a few questions um, that we've put together ahead of time. And Rick, I'm going to start with you as the chair of the committee and the group. Can you talk a little bit about the purpose of the group, um, some of the data you may have used to make informed decisions, um, and the methods that you utilize um, to really put the structure of online learning together? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, it's, it's a great question. And so it, it's sort of, you know, you don't always see how, how the sausage gets made. So this was, a, was an interesting process. So our charge was to develop a remote learning uh, and teaching model that would approach what we did in the spring with a new perspective. And to do that, we needed to examine things like when we taught classes, time blocks, modular approaches, and the latest pedagogical research and activities like that. So what we did as a committee, and this was, a, a, to me, it was a fantastic group of, of, I think it was nine or 10 faculty. It was five students and let me see, seven uh, staff members who came together all with completely different perspectives on, on what, a, what a college education should look like in a remote and an online environment. And one of the things that we did at the very beginning is we really went back and asked, what are the most important aspects of a Bowdoin education? And what are the things that we need to preserve in an online environment that would come naturally, or to use the word organically, in, a, in an on-campus environment? So we spent 
I think most of the first meeting that we were together, we spent just sort of contemplating that issue and then getting back and, and trying to refocus ourselves and, and start asking, what can we put into place in an online environment that will replicate as well as possible the Bowdoin experience that everybody really would prefer to be having and the one that I suspect all of you love very much. So what we did is we, we split ourselves up into small groups and we started looking at, at many different aspects. Um, and, but we looked at pedagogy, we looked at lab classes, we looked at performance classes, lecture-based classes, and we, we tried to look at all of those things. But importantly, what we did is we surveyed both the students and the faculty to find out what they thought worked and, and maybe even more importantly, what didn't work. And because some of the things that you do when we went to re re uh, emergency remote teaching, we did, I wouldn't say it was a panic, but I would say it was pretty darn close to, we just got to get this out there and get through the semester. And, and that's okay. The students were really forgiving about that during the, uh, the second semester last year, but that's not an acceptable way to approach delivering an online education that has the kind of um, underpinnings, backgrounds, and success that a Bowdoin education has. So we surveyed a lot of people. We did a lot of pedagogy research. We, we read a lot of things. Uh, we talked to a lot of people. We talked to both people both inside um, uh, the college and people outside the college, people who had been doing this for a long time, who are frankly professionals at putting courses and, and things into an, an online environment. And what we tried to do at the end of that is come up with a program that would take what we do at Bowdoin and, and do at Bowdoin really well and then translate that in the best way possible so that our students would get the education and the learning experience that we think is, is the important one. And I, I guess that the big thing that we came up with is there's some things that we really found throughout the year that were gonna be important and uh, we needed to, to replicate. We found out that we needed to be flexible because everybody is in a different environment right now. We, we don't have the students essentially all around the quad essentially doing the same thing at the same time during the day. So my, my workflow during my day is completely different than the workflow of a, of a student who might be in Singapore or frankly, a student who, who might be in Southern California, just that time difference. So we thought about different models of the time blocks and we thought about different ways of, of offering the education. And what we came up with is that we thought that most of the education should be delivered in a manner where a student could, could get it at their own pace, asynchronously, provide videos, and then uh, that the student could watch at their own pace. The nice thing about them is, and I'm finding out that this really is true, they can rewatch them. They can't rewatch a lecture that I do in Cleveland 151. They, if they miss something, they have to, you know, start talking to their neighbor. But they, my students are telling me that they rewatch the videos. Some of them are telling me they're watching at 1.5 speed on Zoom, which kind of bothers me. But they're like, no, I got most of it. And I just rewatched the thing that I didn't understand two or three times, and I can get it done a little bit more quickly. Um, but the also the thing that we have a hard time replicating is sort of that the social relatedness, the sense of belonging and the, and the classroom experience. We all have friends, I, my lifelong friends. I, I looked at this the other day. My best friends in the world are the people I took organic chemistry with in 1981 and 82. I, literally, after all these times, and we didn't know each other when we walked into that classroom, but they're the people I call up on the weekends. And so that's the thing that we're trying hard to replicate. And there are ways of doing that. People are approaching it many different ways. Uh, in my class, for instance, we use a lot of breakout rooms. My students are in groups of four and they work on all problem sets together. I don't know if they're friends with each other, but at least they can work in my class and, and, and start learning as a group like we would have been doing in a classroom at Bowdoin. So we wanted to be student-centered. We needed to make sure the course materials were available and accessible to all of our students. We needed to make sure students had the ability to access our courses. Um, we needed to build community. We needed to make sure that everything we do is equitable. That if a student is in one environment, they get the same learning experience as a student in a different environment. And at the same time, we need to make sure they stay engaged because if a student's off just looking at videos, it's really easy to glance down at your phone and get distracted, multitask, it doesn't work. And we also need to make sure our students were going to be challenged with viewpoints other than the one that they brought to the classroom. 
So all of those things come together into something that we value about a, a Bowdoin education. And the plan that we came up with and the, the structures we tried to put into place were to address those issues. And so we can, if, if people have questions about how we got there, we can go over those. But those are sort of the big points that we, um, we felt we needed to hit to make sure that the education we're delivering in a different modality would approach what we have when we were on campus as a group, right? That's the hope and you know, the proof will be in the pudding. We'll see what, what ends up happening. And it, it's a big experiment and you, know, you have to be flexible. Thank you so much for that, Rick. I can imagine how much time and effort went into this endeavor and uh, the laborious nature of um, creating something from scratch. Um, so thank you for all of that. Yeah, I'll just say I'm not sure I ever want to chair a committee of 22 ever again. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did that expertly, though. Um, so you mentioned something about, um, again, accessibility and making sure students, um, regardless of where they are located, could still access the materials in an equitable manner. So I'm going to switch this question over to Michael, because I think it um, is a natural segue, where I imagine that the amount of support IT had to deliver to both Rick's committee, but also faculty and students was um, Herculean. Um, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the infrastructure um, that the IT had to work with um, to ensure that, again, learning could happen in this remote environment uh, and how IT really prepared uh, for this semester. Uh, I have to smile, right? So the question of how we prepared uh, for the fall semester is a very different answer than what we did for the spring. So, so we were really fortunate because the, um, most of the infrastructure we had already been working to put in place um, that would that turned out to be the things that we relied on to really support the remote teaching in the spring and the online learning for the fall, right? Um, that making sure that the tools and systems we put in place, you didn't have to be on campus to access them well. And right? that was a model we had spent the last couple of years really trying to rethink. Um, in my experience in residential uh, liberal arts institutions especially, that model that everything's built around that close relationship between our faculty and students is wonderful. And it also tends to be um, uh, modeled, to use that word again, in a lot of the other ways we design the way the things that we do, which is wonderful until things like this happen, like a power outage or some other reason that people need to be off campus, you discover the limitations of that design. So we have been rethinking some of that anyway. And uh, Rick's point about the amount of time we had to play, plan for the spring pivot. I try not to use that word much anymore since we're using it all the time, but this is the place that applied. Uh, we made the decision to not bring students back from spring break, which effectively gave us two weeks to pivot to make sure everything could work um, and that people could continue to, to, students could learn and the faculty could get to their resources. So that one was a much different process. I, I joke that it was a break glass version, right? It was, this was far less methodical. It was all about what's the solution a faculty member knows already and is inclined to use. How can we put those resources in place? Um, and we've got these really amazing graphs that will show you. My favorite one is the, the total number of um, Zoom or Microsoft Teams video conferencing sessions that we do in one day. Before March, our high, high water mark was 15. Um, the last one I saw, we were over 900 in one day, right? And for an institution of our size, it, it's just, it's a phenomenally different scale of, of experience and the resources we're leaning into. So when the conversation started for the fall, um, I, and I should be, be clear on this, I was not actually a member of the committee. A member of my team, our senior director for um, academic technology and consulting, Stephen Hauser, was actually on the committee itself. But I took the position that my role could be to help support Rick and the committee itself. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So in some cases, it was making introductions and sharing contacts for colleagues that were doing this kind of work in other places. Um, but then also, you know, how could I stay uh, as closely aligned with the work the committee was doing so that IT was in a position to execute on the recommendations and not waiting until the end and then suddenly scrambling to figure out what we were going to do? And so Rick was phenomenal. He was transparent and open and willing to sit down and, and share. Here are some of the things that we're learning. Here are some of the ideas that are coming out. Um, and I'll point to a couple examples that I'm sure we'll come back to, but the, the structure that we put in place at the end to execute on this program, the, of course we had to brand it because we're higher ed. 
um, the Bowdoin Online Learning and Teaching Team, BOLT is the short version, um, was a direct result of the work of the committee. And the iPad initiative that I, I know a lot of people have known about was also a result of the work that the committee had done because some of the conversations we were having with them, um, we put those pieces in place. And some of it we started to do even before the committee's work was done because we knew we needed the runway to get started. So those are examples I would offer. Great, thank you for that. I'm sure we're gonna have a number of questions around the iPad program and um, how the learning is um, being, or taking place utilizing that new tool that students have. Um, but Katie, I'm gonna to switch to you and ask um, if you could speak a little bit about the support faculty received um, to again transition from being in the classroom to really delivering their education um, and really any um, hallmarks of pedagogy that you worked with them and then what kind of support students um, are also receiving right now um, as they are navigating, you know, a, a different remote experience um, in the fall semester. Um, and I guess the other question that I'll add in there too is um, if you can also um, speak a little bit to how equity and inclusive excellence is trying to be upheld. I know that that was something that faculty have really been working in prior semester. So I'm curious how that's happening in an online um, and remote fashion. Sure, thanks Claudia. And you can remind me if I forget something <laughs> those questions. Um, but I was thinking the one thing that I've heard Rick say that he didn't say this time is that when we were on this committee, we didn't know what the decision was yet about what the fall was gonna look like. And I think that's an important thing to remember that basically this work was all happening that as like this was one possibility for what this fall could be. And so it wasn't actually until the end of June. I mean, faculty really had sort of two months to get ready, which is a huge difference from two weeks in the spring. Um, but they had two months to sort of prepare for this fall and what that was like. And so we tried to do a couple of different things. So one of the sort of one of the more fun things that we did was that we worked with Bates and Colby on this course design experience. So faculty had the opportunity to either do a three day intensive or a three week sort of more slower paced course where they got to pick one course they were teaching in the fall, sort of rethink their learning goals for the course, what would work for the environment that they were gonna be teaching in. And what was fascinating is that each college made a different decision about what was happening in the fall. So there were just great conversations that happened as a part of that. There was so much learning that happened between faculty. They thought about their assignments and then they thought about sort of what would they do day to day in their classes. And so we had, I think at, from Bowdoin, over a hundred faculty participated in those three over the summer. So there was one in June, two in July, and then one in August as well. And then at some point we also made the decision because as you all know, we have a pretty small staff. And so especially academic technology and consulting that group was going to be overwhelmed with the support that we were asking them to do. And so we brought on this outside partner called Everspring to help with some of that support. And so in August, departments also met with an Everspring consultant and with someone from academic technology and consulting and with their uh, instructional librarian who was their liaison as well. And so there were weekly meetings by department that faculty got to share, okay, here's what I'm working on for my course. How do I do this? Are there other ways I could think about that. And then there were tons and tons of individual consultations that happened sort of with all the different support people. Um, but really the instructional designers at Everspring are academic technology consulting folks and then the instructional librarians did so much of the work to sort of support faculty to get ready for this fall in lots of ways and, and sort of think of what was possible. And then with one thing we all know and we've sort of learned with online learning is that it forces us to be much more transparent in our teaching and in our pedagogy. That you can't sort of rely on, oh, I forgot to say this last class, so I'm just going to say it now. You just have to be really clear about what you're doing and why and where things are going, where students can access things. And so we tried to make it much more consistent, at least across courses a little bit. So Blackboard, as you know, those of you who are alum have used, right, became the main portal where, where students go to get access to their courses. 
And then there's a lot of work when you're putting things online that makes it just easier to be more accessible. There are ways that you can just check a PDF so that it's easier to download. So some of those little things faculty just started to do and sort of integrate as they're like curating their course materials, as they're recording their lectures, this idea that we can now have closed captioning. So with video, you can able to have that when you watch something, you can slow something down or speed it up. Um, and then we try to just help faculty. Part of what they did in the course design experience was to be an online learner. And so they really got a sense of like, oh, this is what it's like. This how, is how long it takes to watch something. It's not just the amount of time that it's there. If I want to pause or take notes, it's going to take longer. And so having some of those experiences, I think, helped them to be much more aware of what learners will experience in an online environment. And so that helps to build and create sort of more equity and more inclusion and accessibility as well. Thank you for that. And I have to admit, both you and Rick have mentioned, um, again, the advantages of some of the platforms now, especially with videos and being able to speed up and slow things down. I myself am taking some online classes and that has been something that I have found to be really helpful um, and really having the learning go at the pace that feels comfortable. Um, so Jeremiah, I'm going to switch the, these last two questions to you because again, you are a student experiencing uh, this remote learning um, and I know you obviously had to do the shift in the spring. So can you, first part of the question is talk a little bit about how this is going for you so far. Um, what are some of the benefits you're seeing and again, some of the things that you wish um, could be in place. Um, and then the second part of this question is you mentioned earlier that you were an orientation intern. Um, so you were a support to all of the first year students as they transitioned into their time at Bowdoin. Um, anything that you learned there that you think um, it would be valuable to share with our alums and anything that you learned that you're now kind of putting into practice as you learn um, through this remote um, setting? Definitely. Um, and if I forget something, please remind me. <laughs> But I think it is an interesting position that I was wearing this summer of being both a student experiencing all these things, a student who is coping with what it means for me personally, but then also trying to be a support system for the first years. And so I'm going to kind of split those two modalities because that's what I had to learn to do. Um, and so being a student, first and foremost, I think it's wonderful. The work that's been done and the changes and just the progression was absolutely phenomenal in that in the spring whenever we first came back for a bunch of students what I think faculty and staff really had to clue into that they didn't before is that students have very different home lives and home situations and things that are just not synonymous with who they are or how they can present themselves at Bowdoin. Um, and so for some students going back home now meant that they are full-time employed and they have to work, they have to help their family or they have to help someone somewhere provide and so school and education can no longer be the main focus. And I think that in the spring that was a hard reality for a bunch of people, myself included, um, is we had to kind of tune into each other's home situations in a way that you normally wouldn't have to so exclusively at Bowdoin. Um, and in this new fall semester now, we're seeing so much more preparation and so much better understanding of not only from the faculty side, but also from the student side. Like we under, there was time for, as Michael mentioned, the pivot and so, we now are able to better establish work schedules. We're able to do things in a way that better situates us as students to navigate through the educational learning and the educational processing. So I think that there's this academic side that everything that they're doing, everything that we're being prepared for is now, um, we're experiencing in a much better way in a much more beneficial way. But simultaneously, there's this social interaction, I think. Um, this connection between students that we had to figure out, what does that mean in a new online format? How do you make friends um, when you're completely virtual? And so that's something that likewise we didn't do as well, I think, in the spring and that students kind of stopped talking to each other and we started talking to our friends from high school because we're all now back in the same place in the same town. 
But this fall semester, I think there's been a much more intentional effort to plug in with each other and to really create and foster new friendships and to understand that we're only here at Bowdoin for X amount of years and months. And we really do want to meet as many new people and learn and expand our thinking and our ways of culture and our ways of understanding. And so there's been this support that students have been able to feel from each other, I think, and that I was with a first year yesterday and we just put on Zoom. And so for about three hours, I think we just did homework on Zoom together. And it, like, there wasn't really that much talking, but it was kind of that same feeling of like, oh, you're in H. Hawthorne Longfellow Library and you're sitting next to each other and you're doing work. Um, and that those are just like little adaptions that we're learning to make. Um, and I think that these adaptions I was better prepared for having done the orientation intern position over the summer and being able to see that um, a behind the scenes preview of what happens because I think it's very different being a student and experiencing it and then finding out the committees, the thought, the hours and hours of thinking that goes into any one action that voted then produces and so being able to be behind the scenes this summer and working with the dean's office and student affairs and academic affairs and just pulling from these various places um it better enabled us to understand that in a new remote module and in a mostly virtual module especially that there's a sort of intentionality that you have to work with um like katie was saying that you need to be more transparent it's 110% true, I think, that in the ways that we operate and in our expectations of each other, that we can't always read body language to the most fullest capability. And so if we're still trying to get these academically enriching and socially challenging and transformative experience from our college year, I think the lesson that I took away from the most um, working this job it's just that we have to be really intentional and we have to take the extra time to adapt and that it's really uncomfortable sometimes the first time and that it's scary and it feels awkward and then the next time it feels better and it just keeps on feeling better and better and so i would say that from a student perspective it's even the past three weeks of being in class like everything every week gets better week by week because we're all adapting to this new virtual format Great. Thank you so much for your candor, Jeremiah, and for sharing those personal experiences. Um, so I want to remind all of our viewers that we do have the Q&A box function uh, available for you to ask questions. And we do have a few questions that have already come in. So Rick and Michael, I'm going to throw these to you first. Um, you've, everyone has talked about some of the benefits of this new uh, remote learning, the video technology. Um, accessibility with the ability to have closed captioning. Not knowing what's going to be the long term effects of COVID um, and how long we may have to implement um, some sort of hybrid model or what the learning will be like even a year from now. What are some of the early um, takeaways on what might be um, things we would want to keep around that we are seeing are really um, beneficial to the learning experience? Um, I, I, I'll start off with that one, and, and I, this, that's a really good question, and, and it gets back to something I did nearly a decade ago. I had some, some health issues, and I didn't want six students coming to class, so I had every one of my lectures videotaped, and that was one of the most awful experiences of my academic life because I looked like a fool while doing it. So it turns out making the videos and making them engaging online is a difficult thing to do, but the nice thing is if you teach the class over again a year from now, you have those already in the bank. You've already done, you, you already have done all the lectures. And yeah, we change them from year to year and you can do that. But a, a typical class day for me is maybe four small lectures, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes a piece, and then some other things. I can swap those out. I can offer those to a student and have them available for my classes in any year, even if we're completely in person. And I can have something that's like, well, it's not exactly what I said in class today, but it's a, a you know, it's 90% of it. So a student who's gotten behind us, there's always a student in my class who gets mono and is asleep for three weeks, right? That student then would be able to see all of the lectures that I've done. I don't know that I would videotape a classroom. 
I don't think videotaping classroom lectures actually works very well. I, a lot of places do it, but I, I don't think that the experience you're getting is different in a classroom than watching a video of that classroom. But I, I do find that a lot of the things that I'm putting out there, they're going to stay on Blackboard. All of these um, associated learning um, videos that I put out there, some of them are just general interest. Some of them are YouTube videos of something else. I did one on you know how uh, alkylating chemotherapy drugs were discovered, and they come straight from mustard gas in World War I. So I put a video out there that's going to stay in my class for as long as I teach this class. Um, and so many of those things are out there, and I think they're going to continue. Uh, I don't think Bowdoin's ever going to become a place where everything is online. That's not the Bowdoin experience. We're not going to turn, we're, we're not ever going to try to compete with, with University of Phoenix, right? That's, that's not what we do. But I do think that many of the things that I've learned to do this semester and the intentionality that both Jeremiah and Katie brought up has made it so that I'm actually a better teacher in the classroom because I have to think about, okay, how does this actually impact my students' ability to achieve a learning goal? And once I start doing that, then I can make things that, that directly go to teach the student uh, ways of approaching the subject matter that are effective ways that can then be, if they don't work this year, I throw away the video, I try a new one next year, right? But at some point, Bowdoin will get back to in-person teaching. But all of the things that I have in my pocket that I'm developing now, well, I, I, from my perspective, will continue to be a, a portion of my class. Michael, anything you would add? Yeah, it, I, I, so it's interesting because a couple of things that come to mind for me right off the bat, and, and Rick, definitely agreeing with everything Rick has already described. Uh, the piece on the video, guest lectures, I think, has just because everything is done at a, at a distance now, um, I think we find ourselves much more open to doing guest lectures by video. And that opens up a world of possibilities that someone doesn't have to fly and stay in a hotel. And you know, that it's not even just expense, just the, the amount of, of, of hurdles you have to go through versus being able to drop in for a one hour conversation with someone who's a leader in their field. Um, it's, that's one of the things I think about on the video front. Uh, and actually something that Jeremiah mentioned, the idea that, uh, and I was in a conversation a few months ago that made this point, so this is not my original idea, that liberal arts institutions especially have never intentionally built uh, virtual networks, digital networks for our students. So when a student comes to vote in, they maintain those digital networks they had in high school because they were already active, right? And they're still connected to those friends. So they come to vote in and build new friends with friends, new relationships and networks with people who are here in person. And for the first time now, we've had to step into that world as well. And I think we're discovering there's a lot of interesting opportunities in there. Uh, I remember the first time I got a request from a student org group, it was an improv group that said they wanted to do an improv session over Zoom. And I said, okay, we'll help you. And I have no idea how this is gonna go, <laughs> you know? but it went really well. And it actually, I think, kicked off a lot of other student orgs thinking, well, why don't we do the same thing? even though we've never thought about doing things that way before. And I suspect there'll be things like that we may find a lot of our other opportunity to lean into. Great, thank you. And um, what you just said about digital networks is um, related to a question that's come in for Jeremiah. You talked a little bit about, again, how you're connecting with your peers. And so much of the voting experience is about the learning that happens beyond the classroom and learning from others, um, your peers especially. How are you finding that taking place um, right now? I know you said you were studying um, with a, a first year student as you would in h &L, but um, have you found that um, people are engaging um, beyond and again, dealing with Zoom fatigue for courses? How are students really experiencing a, a residential life in this virtual um, mode? I think it's a good question because the answer is not set yet. Um, very much so that it's this awkward sort of tension that's not bad tension, but it's really good tension of us trying to learn what's the level of intimacy can be with each other and that it, a big way that relationships form and that students converse and you make your best friends at Bowdoin, at least in the experiences of my direct peers and those who I'm close with, it's you accidentally stay up in Smith Union talking until 3 a.m. and then you're like, oh, I have to go do my homework now, sorry. 
Um, it's these casual conversations that you can't be so casual about whenever you're in an online module. And so the question then is how do you create a deep intimate friendship with someone that you're meeting for the first time over a virtual format? And if that friendship can sustain itself really, um, and I'm not sure that we've entirely figured out the answer, but I can say that what we are doing so far is small things like FaceTime we figured out feels a lot more casual than creating a Zoom link to hop onto a Zoom. And then there's like that, those extra steps make it feel more formalized, make it feel weird, awkward. Um, and so for a lot of the conversations that me and my friends are having were it's like, oh, did you FaceTime them or did you Zoom them? Because that's a difference. And it kind of like tells you a little bit about their relationship. Um, and then there are other things like using Instagram DM and sending them funny memes or sending them posts. Like that's a new form of communication that I think we haven't typically used as conversation starters amongst people in my generation. Um, but now we're finding it more and more so. Like there's this something that a kid in my class said today that I'll send him a post to, and that is what I use. It's intentional that I'm trying to start a conversation. Um, and the way that to do that is using this new Instagram digital content um, as a sort of social barrier to enable us to do so. I saw you react, Michael. Is there something you wanted to add? Yeah, actually, I just wanted, well, to tell Jeremiah, thank you for that point, because it, it helps me think about something that we've been observing, and I have not been able to puzzle out why. Ever since we pivoted in March, we've been collecting the, the usage information on Microsoft Teams and Zoom, and the Teams pattern has been our usage is higher at the beginning of the week and it kind of decreases as you go through the week. Our Zoom usage is our exact reverse. We have higher Zoom utilization on the weekends than during the week. And that pattern is held almost every week since March and have not been able to figure out why. So it, and it, we've had a suspicion that there's a lot more um, individual personal use, like outside of class and between students. Uh, but I hadn't thought about the, the piece that you're suggesting, Jeremiah, that there might be this sense of formality and informality that students are also navigating so that what we're seeing is definitely doesn't represent all of the activity of how they're connecting to each other when it comes to just video. Thank you for that. Um, Katie, I'm going to um, switch to you. There's a question again on how students are receiving academic support and how they're um, cultivating meaningful connections with faculty. Um, so I'm curious if from the lens of the Baldwin Learning Center, you can comment on that. And then Rick, I'm going to go to you with um, office hours and how um, faculty are connecting with students in more informal ways. Yeah, and that was, I think, fascinating to me to notice in the spring. I felt like I almost got more one-on-one -on -one time with students when we pivoted to online because you could have those interactions. So it was, it was fascinating to see that there was the barrier sometimes of coming to an office to meet with a professor versus just getting on a Zoom call. They were much more likely to do it. So that was fascinating to see that happen. And then we were very lucky at the Baldwin Center that we had already had this online system that we used for making appointments comes from the writing center world. And so we were using that for writing assistants, for Q tutors, and for our mentors. And what it also provided us was the ability to meet virtually in this space so that students can share their screen, can look at a paper together. Now with the iPads, they're actually sort of working on equations together on an iPad and sharing the screen that way. And so those services have actually been seamless and kept going. Um, in the spring, we noticed there was a little drop in usage when, because we all moved to credit, no credit classes. And I think with everything going on for students, right, they were just getting through the rest of that semester. What we've seen now in the fall is that had has spiked way back up and students are taking advantage of all these resources. So they're meeting with writing assistants, they're meeting with their quantitative reasoning tutors, and they're meeting with mentors to help them figure out how can I set up a study space? How can I manage my time? How can I be aware of what I have coming up? And so setting up sort of structures. So students are really taking advantage of that in lots of ways. And then we also recently in the spring hired a new person to sort of serve as an academic coach and lead our mentoring programs. And so she's working with the mentors. They're starting what we call wicked smart groups 
so students can be in groups together to learn sort of some tech hacks to learn online. Or there's a group now particularly for students who have ADHD and want to sort of get together and figure out strategies that are working for them and share ideas. So those are some of the things. So there's the individual sort of consultation piece as well, but then these groups that are also students are taking advantage of. Thank you. And Brick, is there anything you would add about how faculty are supporting students um, informally or in formal ways? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways. So one of the things that I, I think I said in my opening is we have to be flexible because all of my students are going to have questions at different times. So one of the things I do is that we have discussion boards, we have email and all of those things. And I tell my students, I will I'll tell them when I'm going to look at those, when I'm going to answer emails, and I'll get back to you no later than this, because we're all doing things during the day. We're, I, I don't like being barraged with, with emails, but we also hired uh, TAs and, and learning assistants for our courses, or a lot of us did. And so for my organic chemistry course, for instance, I actually have three students who do uh, each do two hours a week of just drop in tutoring time for the, for the students in my course. So if they're working on homework by themselves, um, uh, they can they can drop into these groups and then they have the ability to have somebody there who who has a good idea of what's going on and then other students who are in the room at the same time or in the zoom session at the same time who can be working on the same thing it was sort of like when jeremiah said he was sort of virtually in h and l working with another student even though they're over a zoom call but I also do the office hours the same way. As a matter of fact, as soon as this gets done, I have office hours for my organic class, Friday afternoon office hours. Um, and, and, you know, it's just, I open up a Zoom session and whoever wants to stop by, they can. It's, it's the same thing. My students used to just walk by my door and if I was at my desk, they could ask a question. And um, it, so it's the same way here. But the idea that we, that we can do this all in one fashion for all of our students isn't really accurate anymore, right? We could always assume our students could come over and meet with us sometime during the week because they were on campus. And so I have students who send me, send me emails in the middle of the night and I get back to them as soon as I can. I know that they're working on things on a completely different sleep schedule than I am. And you know, I can't, I'm, I'm usually not awake at 3 a.m. I mean, and, and I'm not checking my email if I am. But the idea is we just have to be as flexible as possible. So the students, I think, are still getting their questions answered. And it might even be a little bit more effective than it was previously, because I, you know, there's a lot of communication that we have encouraged between the faculty and the students. Make sure your students know when you're available. Lay it out for them. Put something on there so that they know when they can expect to have a response from you. And if we do that, and that's the intentionality, we just put it out there. And rather than just guessing that a student knows what an office hour is, right? First year students don't know what office hours are. They think it might be the time where they're not allowed to come to your office because you're working, right? Um, so we have to just intentionally tell our students, uh, come and ask me questions between 2.30 and 4 on Friday afternoon or you know Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock. So I, I think the support for the students is still there in the way that most of our alums would have expected from the faculty were they on campus. Thank you. And I'm going to stay with you for one additional question. Um, folks are curious if there's any consensus from the faculty as to the quality of work that students are turning in. Earlier you had mentioned you know, the distractions that are inherent in remote learning. Um, so what is it that you're seeing in your classes or discussions that are coming up in uh, faculty meetings? What we're seeing, so I'm going to I'm going to dissociate last semester from this semester, okay? Because last semester a lot of things were going on, and and I don't want to say nobody knew what they were doing, but a lot of people were adapting to a lot of new situations. And what I found, well, I actually say from last semester, my students all completed organic chemistry. I gave them the same. Uh, it's a standardized national test that I give every year. The students performed on it as well as they had in any other semester. Now, I'll tell you, a lot of the students didn't get their work in by the deadlines, right? They got it done, but they didn't get it in by the deadline that was on the syllabus, you know, back from when we we're in person. This, this fall, what I'm noticing in my class and what I'm hearing from my colleagues is my students are coming back with fewer questions about, I didn't understand what you said in class today. What we're hearing from students is, I've been doing the problems and I really don't understand how to get to this. And so a lot of the questions that I'm that I'm hearing from students are more substantive rather than let's call them procedural. And the assignments that are being turned in, 
I see that they're working with other students, but I would say that the quality of those assignments, and we're, what, three weeks into a semester, so I don't want to make a grandiose statement, but the quality seems to be equal to what I was, what I was seeing when they were on campus. I, I, I was grading homework this morning. I mentioned to my wife that why is it after 27 years asking the same question, my students are still getting the answer wrong in the same way? And the answer is because I haven't taught them how to do it properly yet, and I still have to figure out how to do that, right? So they're still doing the same things they've always done, and I think the quality of the work is at the level that we've expected. Now, as we go through a semester, we're going to have to see how that continues and hope that the that the ramp that we normally see during over a course of a semester of more sophisticated work coming from our students continues to to go up but indications are that the students are learning in much the same way that they did when they're on campus thank you um michael i'm gonna direct this question to you um, which is about how the college has continued to manage and help those who have technical difficulties um, with especially if they're dealing with subpar internet um, or equipment. I know that iPads is something that was um, a attempt to equalize the experience, but what have you been seeing ongoing, especially for um, student populations um, that do have more difficulty at home? Sure, and I realize I may have made an assumption here that I shouldn't have, that everyone knows what the iPad initiative is and what we actually did. Um, and so it might be helpful to explain it. As part of one of the outcomes, as I said, from the, the committee's work, the college decided to um, jumpstart and kick off an, an iPad initiative. We had spent the prior year and a half sketching out a mobile computing program um, that in its initial conception, we were going to provide laptops, working to provide um, Apple MacBooks to all of our students as part of their entry into the institution. Um, and we had gotten as far as announcing it as part of the capital campaign that began in, um, in January. It was announced in January pre-COVID, of course, right? So when all of this started, um, we had a lot, laid a lot of the groundwork, but one question we had to answer right away is, do we still move forward with laptops, which we knew we could be helpful in a lot of regards, but also still had some gaps, and internet connectivity was one of them. Another that the committee really helped us see was using the digital inks, using the Apple pen pencils with the, in the combination with the iPads, would open up a lot of opportunity for um, the, the sciences, chemistry, physics, um, non-Roman character languages, for them to interact with their students in very different ways that would be more supportive of doing this from a distance and doing it online. Right? So those are the reasons that we started to look at iPads and we were weighing the difference between iPads and the laptops. And in addition, we chose iPad Pros that have built-in cellular internet connectivity so that they can actually connect on their own. Um, and the college went the extra step of making the offer to any student that, if you can afford it yourself, you feel free to turn it on yourself, add it to your personal cell phone account, add it to your family's account. If cost is an issue, reach out to the college, we set up a process and the college will pay for that service. Um, in the US, we are adding those accounts to the, uh, those devices to, the, to Bowdoin's um, AT&T and Verizon account. And I'm really proud of the team that's doing this work. They've actually gone so far as to look up the addresses where the students who are requesting that it be paid for, where they're spending most of their time, and then finding the cell phone provider that works best in that area. They're actually looking up coverage maps. So this isn't random and we're just not just picking the, the device, of, excuse me, the carrier that we already have a relationship with. And for students who are studying outside of the US, we're taking a similar approach, but instead of creating accounts, like a whole bunch of accounts in a bunch of different companies, countries, excuse me, for a handful of students, we're working with those students to provide the resources to offset the cost so that they can get the service themselves. So those are my two starting answers. The other piece that happened with technical support, in addition to the things we've always had for students to email questions or call in, because we picked Apple devices, they can provide, they can actually receive support at any Apple store, any in the, anywhere in the world, because a warranty is attached to the device and you don't have to be a Bowdoin employee to be able to take that device in and get some support. So we've added a couple of layers. Now mind you, this doesn't work everywhere and it doesn't solve everything, but if we feel it does go considerably further than we were in a position to do previously. Thank you. And Katie, I know you've been busy answering some questions and some of these um, kind of come from uh, some of the points Michael was making around courses that do use lab time, studio classes, um, the arts. 
can you speak a little bit to how um, you've been supporting faculty to be creative and innovative um, with the, that piece of the learning experience? Sure, and, and Rick knows more about the labs in lots of ways, but I, I've been so impressed that this happened in the spring and then more and more faculty are doing it this fall of basically creating kits that they're mailing to students in their class, um, which is just sort of fascinating to see. So they're sort of thinking about what they want them to do in the semester, and then anything that they could sort of send to them that they could use to sort of have, do an experiment or to create something or as a stimulus for an art project, they're mailing to them, which has just been fascinating to see. And then there's been a lot more sort of like physical demonstrations of things. So whether it's live or pre-recorded, where they're setting up these really intricate ways to have our camera look down and to watch their hand draw something, right? So students still get to see that process as well. Um, but that's, it's been really fascinating. But those, I think, especially even as we were working on this report, those were the big areas to try to figure out how do you have this high quality learning for these art classes and the labs online. So Rick, I don't know if you wanna add a little bit more about the labs. Um, I can, so a lot of the labs, a lot of the people are, some things go very well, you know, so uh, some, I don't wanna pick on anybody, but you could imagine somebody going for a walk in an ecology class through a different environment rather than going to the Bowdoin Pines, right? And you can accomplish many of the things in an online environment, you know, directed appropriately, but, other ones just don't translate as well, right? And, and there's some things that it, it pains me that my organic chemistry students right now are not in the lab, you know, mixing chemicals together, but there are just some things we can't do. So what we've had to do is we had to think about what experiences can we offer them and then think about where we're going to put those learning experiences in a future semester so that they actually get the, the, um, the practical experience that they need. So, um, you know, so some people are, are sending the, the kits home, other people are, are making, you know, as Katie said, I know that the, the studio art people have this figured out and they actually have a very interesting program. Um, but, you know, it's a challenge and, you know, it's one of those things. It's, there are certain things you can imagine. How do you do a chorus when you're virtual with given the, the lag time or the latency, you know, it's these words that weren't in my, my vocabulary six months ago and now get thrown about with abandon, but you can't really do it very well, right? And so we're, we're just having to rethink about how we offer experiences this semester and then think about where we're going to make up for those experiences in future semesters. Because at a certain point, a chemist needs to mix chemicals together. And as I've said many times, it's literally illegal for me to mail them to somebody's home. Right, and not that I'd want to do that either. Nobody needs to have ether boiling on their kitchen stove. So, um, but yeah, it, it's a real issue, but we've gotten as good as we can. You know, my lab instructors are wearing GoPro cameras on their chest and they're carrying out the lab and then they're making mistakes and students have to choose their own adventure and they have to choose the correct way to do it. And sometimes I get to start all over again because they chose the wrong direction, right? But it, it's, it's what we can do and then we'll make up for the rest of it later. Thank you. Um, and Jeremiah and Rick, I'm curious if you can comment on this question, um, whether you, Jeremiah first, if you felt that the move to the virtual model impacted your ability to select courses and the breadth of the curriculum that you were accustomed to from your first year. Um, sure, I think that there's a, better grasp on depth of courses and what it's going to be in that when we read through the course selection handbook, um, the courses made it very clear kind of what they were going into, I think, in a way that normally it's you show up on the first day and you get a syllabus and you read through it and you're like, oh, that's what we're really doing. Um, that we now had that knowledge beforehand and so amongst me and my friends, we we're more willing and more daring, I think, to go into areas that we typically don't. I know one of my friends is doing two INS credits this year instead of just one because she's like, I'm really going to go for it. I'm going to try it out while we have this online module where I can just rewatch the video three times because that's what it's going to take. Um, and so I think that in, it very much does impact our course selection, but not in the ways that we originally imagined and said it's in ways of 
confidence and this like daredevil spirit of I'm going to try it out because this semester has been so crazy like might as well try a crazy class. Love there's still that adventure some spirit there. Um, Rick is there anything you would add from the faculty viewpoint if there were any changes to course offerings by department? Yeah, I, I do know that some departments redid the way, a lot of departments redid completely what they were teaching. So I know that the um, uh, um, theater actually put a, took one course out of, the, out of their schedule and put one in called acting for the camera, right? So if we're gonna do this, let's act, you know, since we're gonna be doing it on camera, we might as well actually practice doing it for the camera. Um, other ones, I, I know I moved, we moved things between semesters because the, you know, we're all hoping we can be back in the spring semester. It isn't looking completely likely, but we all hope we can. And, and there's some classes that it was worth just switching semesters to see whether or not maybe next semester we could have a, a different set of students. Um, but I'll tell you that my organic chemistry class, for instance, the enrollment is higher this year than it was last year. And I think that might be Jeremiah's. There might be some people in there. It's like, oh, I'm gonna take organic chemistry this semester and I'll do it online and I might not have ever taken it before. And, and so when I look at that, um, you know, I think some students are making the, the intellectual leap saying, I'll do it and, and we'll see what happens. So uh, looking at it from the department thing, it's hard to say what's going to happen next semester because I don't think any of us know what the model is going to be and we don't know necessarily what we'll teach during that model. There were some changes I know that were made to the curriculum this semester, but I don't think it was, none of them are impacting the ability of a student to progress towards a major or towards graduation, right? There's, there's a lot of tinkering. And, but on the other side, people have redone entire courses to make them more uh, amenable to an online environment. Thank you. So one of the final questions I think, oh, yes, Jeremiah. Um, I just want to add real quickly that as well, um, to Rick's point, I think there's also the registrar and I want to plug the work and whoever, I don't know where that committee kind of came from or what that brainchild was, but there's also support provided for the actual grades um, and for navigating what to do if your grades start declining. And so having that built-in support that was made known to students before the semester even started. I think that's also been part of what's helped encourage the push to try out new things is knowing that there's going to be accommodations and understanding and there's going to be support provided from the registrar's office as needed. Thank you for that. And yeah, there are a lot of offices I, I know that are not getting the kudos they deserve for supporting students and also being quite innovative. So thank you, Jeremiah, for giving a shout out to the registrar's office for all their work. Um, so I'm looking at the time and there was one question that I wanted to ask and then I'll see if anyone has any final remarks. But Rick and Katie, um, earlier you had talked about some of the work that you had done with other institutions. Um, Colby and Bates were mentioned as um, part of the um, sessions over the summer with faculty and Rick um, you mentioned speaking to a number of institutions. Um, folks were curious if Bowdoin had consulted with public higher ed um, colleges and universities who perhaps have been um, teaching remotely um, and doing online learning um, far longer than Bowdoin. Yeah, so we had a, a very interesting conversation that was set up through Michael with the, with the people at Penn State who run their online learning programs there. And, and it was interesting how much they were in almost the same boat that we were. You know, so they have, uh, what, 45,000 students in, in the Penn State system. And even though they've had a a great online learning environment for a long time. Moving everybody remote is a completely different experience. But we were able to talk with them um, for a while and, and get some really good perspectives on how to deliver an effective online course. So we did do that, but then the other thing we did is the Everspring, the external consultants have been working with, with public universities for a long time, moving lots and lots of programs. It was interesting. I was doing a Zoom call with some friends from uh, that I grew up with, and it was at least two, no, not at least two of them had children taking courses that had been designed by Everspring, right? And they were doing it. One was a, a, a master's of social work course, and the other one was a certificate program at, at, at one of the um, Chicago universities. I, I forget which one. But it was actually very nice that 
I was able to hear that the kinds of courses being recommended that my, my friend's children were taking were the same ones that the same consultants were helping us design our courses for the spring. So it, it's sort of related to that public university thing. And, um, but yeah, the Penn State one was very helpful to us. Thank you for that. Katie, anything you wanted to add? Okay, so I wanna be mindful of time. It's almost two o'clock, which I think is, uh, we're heading right into the hour that we were allotted. So I want to just take a moment to thank all of you for all of your thoughts and comments and for the immense amount of work and dedication you've put forward to supporting our students this semester and um, you know, probably into the next semester and who knows um, how long. But thank you all for your time. And to all of the alums, thank you so much for your questions. Um, as an alumna of myself, um, Anytime I get to hear from faculty or staff who are working day in and day out with students, it makes me incredibly proud of the institution. So on behalf of all of our alums who are joining us, thank you so much. Um, so I wish you all a great afternoon and for our alumni volunteers, um, I hope you continue to engage thoughtfully and meaningfully during the rest of the conference. Um, but thank you for spending this past hour with us. So good afternoon, bye. Thank you. Bye everybody.